Detroit was once the seat of the world's greatest economic empire, the auto industry. Whether you came from Southern Europe, the Middle East, or the American South, the factories were always hiring and the pay was good. But as this empire of cars weakened and crumbled, the city's economy began to revolve around a new business, illegal drug distribution. The day I arrived in Detroit, I was shown two bodies that had been placed inside of the trunk of cars at the Detroit uh, Metropolitan Airport. And the stench, the bodies were decomposed and you could see uh, the maggots. And that was my first trip to Detroit. And it was one of the most devastating experiences I ever experienced. 67 is as if it was biblical, as if someone blew out the light my life turned upside down. The, the, the armies of addicts, it, it was like unbelievable. We never recovered. People breaking in our houses, uh, snatching gold. All the places I had visited, Detroit to me was the most out of control that I, that I had ever experienced. Between 1965 and 1970, violent crime more than doubled in the United States. Why this happened has never been fully explained, but the confluence of drugs and the breakdown of social control associated with the civil rights movement and the war in Vietnam were certainly key factors. Nowhere was more out of control than Detroit, Michigan, which had suffered the deadliest riot of the 60s and had become the murder capital of the country by 1971. In the spring of 1972, the Bureau of Narcotics sent John Sutton to Detroit on a special assignment to infiltrate and bring down the city's largest black heroin dealers. Some of the intelligence that we were picking up on uh, indicated there was a mafia operating in Detroit, what they call a black mafia. Agent Sutton arrived in Detroit to find a city divided. On the one hand, Detroit had the most thriving black middle class in the country, mostly thanks to the auto industry, and many people were living the good life. It was a genius. But, but that, that's, that's the summary of where we were at in 1965. There was plenty of work and the bosses were paying. The community had beautiful homes. Everybody was drinking good whiskey. Everybody was eating good. They were taking trips. And then I saw a kind of a, a black affluence that I had never seen in other cities like Los Angeles, Chicago and places. Everybody was driving a new car, and, and naturally American-made car. Big Cadillacs, Fleetwood, Thrones, uh, Eldorados. Uh. This was the neighborhood to grow up in. A zillion young girls, the, the highlight. Life was good in those neighborhoods. Everybody had jobs and they had their parents in the home. You, you ate good, you had 500 different little local eateries that were good. You didn't have to go downtown. On the other hand, it was a city where entire police precincts were overrun by heroin dealers and stick-up men. I uh, immediately detected that there was something missing here, that there, that, that there was a tremendous erosion of the political system and erosion of the police department, erosion of the uh, religious system in the city. The police was trying to come down hard on, they called them the Big Four, the Big Four. And they was always coming through the neighborhood trying to uh, intimidate the blacks. They would pull us out, take us to Bel Air, and put us out there in the water and shoot at us. I was one of them that they put out there and shot at. I drove over around Livernois and I heard what I thought was firecrackers. This was pre-4th of July, and I was later told that it was the 10th precinct. Two agents who had been previously assigned here had been relocated out of death threats. And they had put contracts out for their life. I'd seen the pruitt Igo housing area of St. Louis, the Cabrini Greens, the Robert Taylor in Chicago, the front in Baltimore. I'd seen the Watts, uh, Nickerson Gardens, the Jordan Down Project, some of the real bad neighborhoods. And even down in Mexico, Tijuana and Calexico, the most fearful part of my life working drugs was here in Detroit. Uh, some of the most violent people that I've met were here in Detroit. Detroit had few black police officers in the 1950s, so the department had a hard time infiltrating the city's burgeoning drug infrastructure. 
that they were having a lot of, and during that time, a lot of problems. And a lot of black guys were in traffic uh, selling heroin. I was sent here to do a, a police officer who apparently worked narcotics and had gone into the dope dealing business by the name of Marzette. And he was a kingpin in Detroit. Henry Marzette was a hometown boy and Korean War veteran when he entered the police academy. Starting off as an undercover narcotics cop under Detective Vincent Persante in the 1950s, Marzette set arrest records working in the Livernois retirement area. Recruited him out of the police academy, put him in business, big cat like fine wardrobe, and he was, he was like setting records busting guys. But soon started playing both sides of the fence and was convicted of corruption in the late 50s. And when he went to prison, he began to work uh, for the Italians uh, as a muscle and so forth. But even bigger than that, he made his connection. After a short stint in prison, Marzette came home, determined to take over the streets. He knew the system, and that's what made him very good. Uh, he was the, the new drug czar from the dark side, and he was the man. Marzette made his first major move in 1960, when he had three young prostitutes lure a major West Side dealer named Mississippi Red to a motel room, where Marzette was waiting with a shotgun. Now, I, I met Marzette in 67. I had an uncle who was digging the street line, and I was in total awe. He left his big black uh, Fleetwood Broham Love Park while he was shopping, and the cops didn't ticket him, which was unheard of. That was absolutely unheard of at that time for a black man. 1970, Henry Marzette makes his final bid to control the streets of Detroit. He calls a meeting of top heroin dealers known as the West Side Seven. He proposes that they work together to purchase and distribute heroin without the Italian mafia, who controlled a group known as the East Side 12, made up of mostly white, high-level dealers with black lieutenants. The alliance falls apart when certain dealers won't bow down to Marzette, kicking off the deadliest drug war in Detroit's history. During this time, Marzette was stricken with kidney disease, and on his deathbed, perhaps to make amends in some way for the destruction he had wrought on Detroit, he had his chief hitman, James Moody, executed and put into the trunk of a car, bringing the drug war to a halt. As the auto industry slowly faded and Motown Records fled to Los Angeles, the economic vacuum was filled by a new spirit, the spirit of crime. They made me a ward of the state, 10th. That's when they came to my mother's house and took me because they said that my mother couldn't, my mother couldn't control me. Nobody wanted to be my friend unless I gave them something. So then I learned how to be mean and nasty to the ones that uh, always tried to play me for money or food or... Detroit's industrial base had begun to die by the early 1950s, leaving a pool of unemployed men to populate the streets. These are not kids. They're men who need jobs for a living. It's estimated that one-third of Detroit's inner-city workforce is unemployed. Between 1953 and 60 alone, the East Side lost 71,000 out of 102,000 industrial jobs. It's just not enough jobs. What are they going to do when they stop the war and bring jazz home? There's no jobs. This is what causes the crime rate to be so high. Traditionally, Detroit reflects the best or the worst of the nation's economy at any given time. Right now, the unemployment rate here is more than twice what it was two years ago, and by all indicators, it is still rising. Take no work, man. That's all. Where people want to pay you for what you're worth, you know. And every man, I think, knows his worth. I know a man. And then that's the same. That's it. I need a, I need he wanted to immobilize these two dope dealers because he believed people selling drugs who worked for the automotive industry would cause the complete destruction of the automotive industry. He stated that cars that were assembled on Mondays and Fridays were lemons, that they were no good because of uh, the drug use. Sutton's chief target, Henry Marzette, had died of kidney failure just before his arrival. So Agent Sutton turned his attention to Marzette's remaining lieutenants and the remnants of the West Side Seven. Within a day of arriving in Detroit, uh, Marzette died of, apparently of natural cause, and Devil Jackson had gotten shotgun in the face the night before. And there was some indication 
that the person that killed Della Jackson was one of the informants that I would be working with. We had uh, Eddie Jackson, we had another Jackson by the name of, I think it was Ernest Jackson, he had a street name of Boogie Bear. I know when I was in the Defenders, I was assigned to represent a guy, his real name was Arnold Wright. Pretty Rick was a, he was a pimp is what he really was, and, and he was from our neighborhood, he was from around Mumford. Milwaukee Jack, who was uh, Marzette's lieutenant, and I bought heroin from John Mays, uh, Milwaukee Jack, on several occasions. During the time that I was here, they were averaging almost like two murders a day, and then the weekend would come around, there would be 12 on that weekend. The dope dealers had guns like I'd never seen. They had a saying that it's better to be tried by 12 than carried by six. The 10th precinct was where the city's black elite mixed with the underworld to form a strange nexus of black power, crime, and social disorder unique to Detroit. I saw people driving by, black males driving by with uh, guns and, you know, 45 automatics, the old military 1911 type, and they would lock around in the uh, chamber and hold it up and give the power to the people sign. Agent Sutton spent only 90 days in Detroit, but in that brief time crossed paths with a rogues gallery of characters. And when I went to his house, he had like about 25 buyers in his house to buy heroin, and I was low on the pecking order. And when the number reached 25, he went to the stash and came back with a shopping bag full of heroin. My brother was, uh, was addicted to that stuff. And I seen what he was going through, and I was like, whoa. One of the things that was frightening was that the people who were man in these dope houses were addicts. And there was a reputation that, you know, to watch them because they had a tendency to go on the nod, and when they come out of the nod, they would forget what they were doing, and they could easily shoot you. Charlie used to just give me money to sit on his porch to make sure that the police wouldn't hit him. I would keep watch up and down the street. He was selling Hera. None of Agent Sutton's targets was more dangerous than the infamous hitman, Chester Campbell. The notorious hitman named Chester Campbell saw him initially while buying dope in a dope house. Coil, I think the street was on Coil. And when Campbell walked into the room, there was a kind of a, an eeriness about him. And the guys, they were mobbed. One guy wanted to be like him, talked about he was one of the famous hit men, the killers that he earned like $10,000 a hit. In that particular case, the informant ended up being killed. I met Chester Campbell once in my life, and I went to see him in the county jail. In the county jail, the whole county, it's really small. When you looked at him, you know, you're looking at him like I'm looking at you and you don't see nothing. You just look, those eyes, he was, he was, uh, and he was very, very smart. But in that case, the informant uh, ended up dead and his body was identified. He had been eaten by the field rats and he was identified by a thumbprint that had not been devoured by the field rats. I suspected that uh, Chester killed this person while I was inside of his house buying dope and the guy suspected that I was a police. He called the informant into the room and he wanted me to front the money. I wouldn't front it. And uh, he had a little girlfriend, a little attractive, light complexion female. And when we, I told him he was in the police finding business that we would go and spend our money where they were selling dope. And we left, and as we were leaving and going back to the undercover car, the young lady ran out and said that she would uh, cop the dope for us. A, a blue Cadillac Fleetwood Brown pulled up in front of a house. It was her mother's house, and we were standing on, sitting on the front porch. A guy on the passenger seat had what appeared to be a Thompson machine gun. He brandished it like that and looked at me and the informant. And then they drove away. About 20 minutes later, she came back driving that Cadillac. She indicated that this was a connect. And if he thought I was the police, he was going to spray us right there with that gun. He was going to kill us there on the spot. When Chester Campbell was arrested in 1975 after running a police car off the road, authorities found four loaded guns in his car, along with notebooks containing 300 names, including those of murder victims, dead police informants, and politicians, along with diagrams of their homes and notes about their daily routines. But back in 72, I think we put away a large number of those dope dealers. 
And I think, hey, we not put them away at that time, this city would have been completely destroyed by the dopers and the murders that were taking place. As Henry Marzette lay dying in his hospital bed, Detroit's economy was slipping away along with him, and the young people of the city began to look toward the street instead of the factory floor for their daily bread. At the end of 73, me and my friend, we started selling a little weed. Child started wanting us to push a little hair around for him, so he'd give us 10 packs. We'd take the 10 packs and go out there and sell them. Then we'd go back, get him the $90, we kept 10. We see that we were taking him all the money, so we said, man, maybe we need to start getting our own shit and start doing it. Because my friend said, well, ain't he gonna get mad? He get mad all he want. He said, man, but he's supposed to be our friend. I said, yeah, well, he our friend, but he also not paying us much. Every day I was coming home with new clothes. My mom was all like, where we get them clothes from? By the mid-70s, street gangs were coming to power in LA, Chicago, and New York. In Detroit, gangs like the Bishops, Black Killers, and Earl Flynn's terrorized the East Side. They run in with uh, Flynn, two Flynn's. We beat the shit out of them. <laughs> you know, gangs had died. Used to be Earl Flynn's, uh, uh, Bishops, Shane Gang, all that's East Side. West Side was uh, FA's, that's the, uh, them Finkel Avenue boys, PA's, Eight Mile Scones. They used to always come through there shooting. BK was shooting at the Earl Flynn's. And then Earl Flynn was right back over there and shoot up the BK's. You know what I'm saying? We never really claimed that gang kind of bullshit. We just would stump a motherfucker from the police or whoever. They was doing some weed, selling weed and uh, hair on. Little, little hair on. They weren't doing no big time stuff, but they was trying to move up. But because they were shooting at each other, they couldn't move. They couldn't gain foothold. So everybody else that was doing it was moving up. The, the kids that, the young guys who were in the, the Flynn's and all that, were poor kids who most of the time didn't have no money. Kobo Hall, Parliament Funkadelic Flashlight concert. You know what I'm saying? They get ready to land the mothership. It was about uh, eight of us. We glass healed up with them motherfucking uh, Lou Miles suits on. 30 motherfuckers surround us. Bossolinis, baggy ass pants. They had us outnumbered. We was gonna buck. They gave us a pass. You know, we like, Shh. Then they running up and down the hall how we knew who they was with the Earl Flynn. The auto jobs everyone had moved up to Detroit for were rapidly disappearing. But the children of Detroit had grown up in the shadow of the world's largest corporations and were ready to graduate from petty crime to the world of big time drug dealing. What's up, I'm B. Skeeter. Original YBI, 1977. Before the snitching and the bitching. I, I grew up on Yosemite and Elmhurst. But I lived on Martindale and Elmhurst. That's where it all began. That's where YBI started. Just a bunch of young motherfuckers like the little rascal. Little child. We was like all brothers. All our mothers loved each other and uh, loved all of us. In July of 75, the corner of Finkel and Livernois, a solid working class neighborhood in northwest Detroit, was the site of a mini riot that laid bare Detroit's unholy trinity of crime. Stood off by the fatal shooting of 18-year-old Obi Wynn, a black, by a white tavern owner who accused the youth of trying to steal his car. An angry crowd of several hundred residents responded with a rock-throwing, window-smashing, burning spree through the predominantly black business district of Northwest Detroit. They murdered, in, in that, on Livernois, that they murdered a uh, innocent little Polish man. This old white guy got killed on Livernois. It, it was a very sad story. Smashed his head with a cinder block. It would have been a full-blown riot had not Coleman and the Detroit police contained it. Detroit, already in the grips of a devastating economic recession, was ripe for violence. Unemployment approaches 25%, more than 125,000 workers. And the jobless rate among black teens is reportedly twice that of adults. The bar and Andrew Chenarian, the bar owner, now accused of second-degree murder, are both controversial. According to area residents, Chenarian allegedly maintained a white-only policy at the bar. This is a white, honky bar. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because the man, he got a buzzer on there. If you can come down and you see that you're black, you do not get in. Mayor Young today condemned the violence. While some people with legitimate concern showed anger, frustration at the demonstration in front of that bar, other hoodlums and rip-off artists were taking advantage of the situation 
and ripping off the area between Seven Mile and St. Martin's, for instance, uh, on Livernois and other areas. That will not be tolerated. One of the men charged in killing the Polish immigrant was a charismatic 20-year-old from the Dexter and Martindale neighborhood on the west side named Raymond Peoples. Raymond come up out of it. He was acquitted, but you also know that people were disappearing and didn't come to court. We already was doing a little something, but out of the love for Raymond, they slid him right in. He had the gift of gab, he had the respect, everybody loved him, right on top. We had never seen anything like YBI. We had never seen a kid that young, that uh, reserved, that articulate, uh, that smart. We call this the red zone. From Davidson to Joy Road, Livernois, Dexter, red zone. And we held this down. You can't slang shit around here. We started eliminating all these old motherfuckers sitting up behind the door slanging shit, right? Get the fuck on. Mark Dill and Elmhurst, Dexter, and Dwayne, Dexter and Tuxedo, it was the runner. Sally, Sally from the Valley, you know, the big hands and all that. Big man, Bobby and Fatty. If a motherfucker would ask them, damn, damn, who got it? Them young boys got it. Because we was all little kids. When the addicts on Dexter began calling them the young boys, they decided to stamp their heroin packets with that name. We stamped that shit Young Boys Incorporated, not YBI, in cursive. Young Boys. Once the police and newspapers found out about it, the name stuck, and young boys' fever spread across the city. We had spots on Calvert and motherfucking uh, 12, Highland Park, that we tow in half. And we got a lot of crew out of Highland Park once they seen our mentality. Pre and Joy Road was our first spot. We took that bitch. Mac and Gray, a Mac and B wig. Only in Detroit, hometown of three of the world's largest corporations, could a group of teenage drug kingpins call themselves Incorporated. And when I came back in 79, I saw a city that had rotten into the core. Around this time, Nathaniel Boone Craft joined the Army Special Forces, where he received the training he'd later put to use as a hitman in the streets of Detroit. They say Vietnam was over, but yet they still fighting over there undercover. On the download, they sent somebody in to do something. Hey, we was paid to do this, and I did it. They, we basically, like I said, the Army wouldn't talk much about me. Because most of us that did come home, they weren't expecting us to do what we did. July 1979. Three bodies with their heads chopped off are found in a van near John R., just south of Erskine. They had uh, several beheaders. They had one guy uh, had a street name, Doc Holliday, and one guy, street name, I think his name was Frank Usher, uh, Frank Mitty. And they uh, decapitated three, uh, three people. Frank Nitty Usher, suspected by the Detroit police of being the city's largest heroin dealer, is quickly charged with ordering the murders. Notorious hitman and drug dealers James Red Freeman and Adolph Doc Holliday Powell are charged along with Nitty and Robert Partee. The notoriety of the case came because their heads were cut off and the bodies were found. And of course, if it had just been three dead people, they'd have said, oh, there's three dead people. But when you cut somebody's heads off, then of course it became the crime of the century. Usher was convicted as being an aider and a better. Nobody claimed he shot the people. And he was basically there. They were all there. So he was convicted. He was doing a mandatory life sentence. His people came to me. The, the prosecutor's theory was that, Le, that Parti and Red Freeman killed the people. I mean, they were supposed to be the killers. They were the, according to the prosecutor's theory. And the jury convicted Parti, and he's doing life. Another jury acquitted Red Freeman, and he's doing life on another case now. Steve Fishman helped Usher get his conviction overturned in the late 1980s. So I got him a new trial. I think that the evidence showed that he was a target. I think it showed that somebody was trying to have him done. Probably Doc Holliday was now dead. And that Frank, either by force of personality, uh, quick talking, or luck, got to the sideline rather than be one of the victims. Frank Usher is one of the easiest clients I've ever dealt with. I'm still friendly with him to this day. He's been out many, many years. And I had a drink with him three months ago. He's a gentleman. If you didn't know he was Frank Nitty, if people didn't say, oh, Frank Nitty, and you saw him at a ball game or in a bar, he doesn't curse, he doesn't smoke. I never saw that in other cities. I never saw 
of bodies put in the trunk of cars and left to rot. Now, I never saw little kids, uh, preteens, shot in the back of their heads by dope dealers. A lady hired my brother to do something to a number of men. My brother wound up uh, getting in touch with me. We go to do it, I wind up uh, going to prison for it, but it was a number of men that we had to uh, put the frightening of God in them. So you know he, has, he must pay. The corner of John R. and Erskine had been a known drug hotspot since the 1950s. And in 1978, YBI General Dwayne Davis sent his soldiers down on John R. to set up shop. Yeah, we right here on uh, John R. and Erskine. Man, there were so many motherfucking bags up in here. I was the first out of us YBI to come downtown. I came down here working for Raymond Wayne and Bone Man. We had pink coin envelopes with China White stamped on it. And there was a building right here, the old man that sold liquor after hours. I rolled on this corner, he had my dope in the vacant lot. Motherfuckers getting laid out, two to the head, broad daylight. Motherfuckers ODing in the alley. Scam moves, snatch the shit, snatching money, armed robberies, murder. Downtown Detroit is where motherfuckers come from all over Michigan to get dope. Whether it be the Brewsters, John Iron Erskine, Cast corridor to the Jeffrey Project. White, I wouldn't care what. This is dope central. It led me to realize this shit is bigger than YBI. Carl Taylor was running a private security company at Cobo Hall and Joe Louis Arena in downtown Detroit when he first crossed paths with YBI. And one of our guys that was working the doors said, man, this group just came to the side door and they got all these little young guys. And I'm like, well, who is that? And we kept so I thought, well, maybe they were breakdancing or whatever. So we get back, and I got my lieutenants and everybody looking, and, and they get out, and they look at you with a very brazen look. They got out all like little men, and the girls were going crazy. Some of the guys were very, uh, you know, good-looking little guys, had neat haircuts. They had the Adidas identical suits, and so I really was just, and we had about 15 of them, and they had them in the room, and they were uh, making them empty their pockets. And right then you knew you had something different because they were one spokesperson. And he said, why are we emptying our pockets? What have we done? Are we under arrest? Asking questions as season. And they had these bicycle chains. Yo, man, that shit is real. You know, they would be checking you. And then one had that map of America. I mean, I've never seen anything like that. And I got to see the map uh, maybe nine months later. And it had a few diamonds, and nine months later, it had more diamonds. And someone was explaining that was where they made distribution or where they did business. And I couldn't believe it. And then the cops, they got rough with the kids, which would normally scare the cahoots out of regular gang. You, you giving us our shit back, or we're calling our attorney. And within a blink of an eye, they became like experts on what you could and could not do. And there was a a eerie feeling in that room at that point. No credit, no VCRs, no change, no TVs, you know who we are. Look up at us. Yeah, nigga, we them stars. There was a Midtown Hotel up on Woodward in Mac. That's where I used to keep my big stad. And they watching me. So I'm nervous than a motherfucker. We were selling a hundred bundles or better every day. A car pull up. Them peep my stash, ran, but that China white pink pack was so good he came back the next day telling about give me two. I fired on that motherfucker with a short motherfucker right, dropped him, bougie stomping him with them motherfucking cuz and glass heels, you know what I'm saying? Here come Raymond Wayne Bush Rod. Bitch, we the motherfucking boys. Dexter, YBI. We were over on Dexter at Esquire's uh, the, the corned beef place, which was legendary, and suddenly this Corvette drove up. Two young girls got out, and this was in the summer, like in August, and had mink jackets on them, little Venuses, they were just gorgeous. And then a Mercedes drove up right behind us and a BMW, and that was the first time we got to see the whole crew. And the kid who went in to get our sandwiches came back and had screwed up all our orders. All he wanted to say was, why I was in there with their girls? And that's when you knew at that moment that this was something like we had never seen before. And the thrill of being on top, stepping in somewhere and everybody know your name. They were legendary at that very moment. Before rap hit, we was entertainers in the hood. But them boys would start pulling up in them big ass cars and wearing all that jewelry. From there on out, um, 
that neighborhood, which usually responded to the temptations and the celebrity life, YBI was the shit. Intrigued by this new type of youth gang, Taylor kept seeing them at events in Detroit and all around the country, including the Tommy Hearn Sugar Ray Leonard Championship fight of 1981, for which Taylor ran security for the Tommy Hearns camp. From Detroit, Michigan. I was Hearn's bodyguard, uh, ran his security when he fought um, Leonard the first time. And YBI came out, and uh, members of the whole entourage, and came to the fight. They went to the fight as if they were going to Cobo Arena. Who else could fly out to Vegas and stay in Caesar's Palace with us? Not only did the fellas didn't talk, you didn't want to be asking them stuff. I mean, you could end up dead asking the wrong things. As a matter of fact, if I follow the social science method of gathering information, I wouldn't have anything. I speak the language and respect the rules in the underworld and the underground. Growing up in the infamous Jeffries Projects near downtown Detroit, R.D. was exposed to the drug game at an early age. We in the Jeffrey Projects, you know what used to be the Jeffrey Projects. This is where I'm from. This is where it began for me. Before they got us up out of here, every day for us was the hustle. You know what I mean? Get paid $50 a day, stand right here on 4th at the fire hydrant and yell hook down. You know what I mean? Because the big guys was out there selling the packs. The Jeffreys soon became a YBI stronghold, with young dealers leaping on the hoods of passing cars in a frenzy to sell their wares. And in one three-day stretch of winter 1980, 18 people were shot near the corner of Selden and Gibson. Yeah, they was selling hair around. You know, and they can't watch out for the hook and try to serve the customers. So they'd be like, little brother, here, take this $50, stand over there, and when you see the hook, just yell. R.D.'s parents might have thought they made it out when his father got a job working for the Big Three and the family moved out of the Jeffries and onto the near west side. Yeah, they got a job at, at the plant and they moved over on Stoker and Davidson. Well, it looked it better because the neighborhood, man, was, it was laid out. It looked like we moved to the motherfucking suburbs coming out of, coming out the jets, you know what I'm saying? But when you got over there and I got to socializing with them guys over there, them guys was like Martians. I've always been a Martian on this motherfucker. I'm, I'm on earth, but I'm not one of you motherfuckers. You know what I mean? Nobody want to talk to the guys. I had to run down to the projects every day because I couldn't deal with them cats. I don't give a fuck about you and that bitch and the jury, your punk ass car, none of that. Nigga, I'm from Dexter. I'm YB motherfucking I. They kept approaching me with the money. I'm down here making $50 yelling police as opposed to them guys over here. They gonna give us a hundred dollars a day. Well, by us being young, we don't know no better. You know what I'm saying? A hundred dollars a day is great when you're a little guy. Just think what you can do with a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars, man, you can go get some gym shoes, an outfit. You wanted what they had, man, and, and they were smooth about it. Give you a few dollars. Huh, man, come around there and see me tomorrow or something. Everybody be making them out to be monsters and all that shit, man. Them guys wasn't like that, man. Them guys was... They were smooth, man. B took his first arrest while working for Raymond Peoples near Dexter Avenue. I'm in a joint on Calvert and Dexter. I'm getting $100 a week in all the tops I can get. Damn, here they come. I run back. I flush the packs I got. And uh, you selling dope? You, you selling dope for uh, Raymond Peoples? They, they beat my ass a couple of hours. 1300 bogey. Typewriters broke. Desk broke. Chairs broke from where they've been whooping motherfuckers' ass. Catch your cab back on Martindale. Lo and behold, when I hit the corner, the whole crew on the corner, about 60 strong. What happened, B? This is baby Ray, this Raymond people. Shit, I ain't say nothing. My motherfucking man. You know what I mean? That's baby Ray. Beyond the money and the violence, the rise of YBI marked a new era in Detroit. An era in which drug dealers and drug dealing became pillars of the economy and the community. People in the community knew what was going on, man. It just, it wasn't like now. See, now motherfuckers disrespectful, shooting and doing all that stupid shit. Back then, well, we well we hustled there. We kept the block clean. We kept the grass cut. We cleaned the fields. It wasn't no chaos. Wasn't nobody getting robbed. and nobody messed with the neighbors. 
As the gang broke into separate crews, B left Raymond Peoples and went with Dwayne W.W. Davis and was soon making more money than he could spend as Davis's right-hand man. Wayne come over and we talk, we talk, took me shopping, all kind of shit. I want you to get out with me. I said, shit, we on. And Wayne was that guy. He was wearing dark suits, uh, carrying the Italian handbag. So he would tease with me. He says, yo, man, what it take for you to be my guy? And I'm like, you know, you got to be kidding. Laughing. Yeah, right. Uh, I have clients, which I did. I was Yul Brenner's bodyguard and others. Wayne just had gave everything to me. Wayne trying to step out of the game. Wayne had changed his mannerism of dress, speech, wearing this goddamn jerry curl shit, I, I ain't understanding, but he's getting into a whole new crowd of people. You know what I'm saying? These square motherfuckers with that clean dollar. Wayne got a house, man, with a swimming pool in the back. We got business in the driveway, whatever. You know, whatever, the, everything what you would think. But all our neighbors is Jews, Chaldeans or whatever. You know what I'm saying? They like, damn, they stay in they motherfucking window. But I have to tell you, he was driving the Mercedes, I was driving the Mercedes. Mines came with hard earned money. And I think honestly, I probably was a little jealous. The name most often associated in the public mind with YBI, Milton Butch Jones wasn't released from prison until Ray Peoples and Dwayne Davis already had the operation in full swing. I had never even met Bush. I always done heard about it. Bush, Bush, Bush this, Bush that. But I detect a little animosity. I detect a little fear and motherfuckers that knowed him and a lot of motherfuckers who didn't want him coming off into our thing, you know what I'm saying? But let me go back to the time when Butch dropping me and Mark off with uh, 300 bundles going to uh, Highland Park. Young B and uh, uh, Mark, I know y'all with Wayne, man, but I wanna spit something at y'all. I'm gonna take this motherfucking city over. I need y'all to get down with me. Butch soon wanted to take over things for himself and his crew of enforcers known as the Wrecking Crew or the A-Team were the most feared gunmen in early 80s Detroit. In a lot of cases, man, different cases where guys tried to come, you know, tell us we couldn't roll here, we couldn't roll there, you know what I mean? But that wasn't no shit we worried about. We handled the problem right then. We handled it ourselves. Wrecking Crew, all them guys would come later if we couldn't handle it. For the most part, you gotta be able to handle it yourself or you ain't gonna be able to get out. You couldn't hold it. Ain't no sense of you being out there. The young boys first hit the newspaper in 1979 when the Detroit police found out about a free heroin giveaway they were conducting on the west side. We had a great dope giveaway. We passing out cars all through the neighborhood, everywhere. Uh, Dwayne and Justin, the great dope giveaway. 70000 a day, one spot. Hamilton and Highland, we got the whole building. Boom! We got some dope taking a 90. Like New Jack City, the Carter. We was doing the Carter back in 79, you know what I'm saying? We run the dope. If you don't live in this bitch, we ain't letting you in. YBI truly marked the decline and demise of authority, period. They are not scared of the police. A landmark to me as a researcher that this was a pivotal turn and attitudes about young black men in the world. Mayor Young was in office. I remember he had made a speech and he was like, yeah, black man, get your money. But he was meaning it toward uh, black store owners and black businesses. I think at that time they had seen a complete erosion of the law enforcement in the city. And there's no doubt that law enforcement in Detroit at that time from the local level was, they were in up. Young boys on the corner, a motion of poetry uh, that was deadly. And they had no control over it. And this whole concept of using two things that people didn't use before, uh, which was young kids that were juveniles and taxi cabs. Man, we got away with a lot of shit because we was young. You know what I'm saying? They didn't really have no laws for the young kid. They kept this man with 50 bundles, man. About 16,000. Little young motherfucker, who you get that from? Bam, who you who you roll for? I don't know what you talking about. What they gonna do? Nothing. You know what I mean? You have a murder case, you wasn't going to jail. The young adults, they were hell bent toward traffic and drugs, making earning money quickly. We were selling shit five dollars a pack. We the first motherfuckers to come out with five dollar packs of, of, of a mixed jab. Uno all day, every day. No, they didn't want to do like their parents did. They didn't want to go into the automotive industry. Many of them did not want to go to school to get an education. Bush them had the bomb, Hoochie Khan. Raymond them had Rolls Royce. 
Bone Man had so and so. Pontiac, Southwest, Downtown, Hamtramck, North End. North End a bad motherfucker. Man, we was everywhere. We was everywhere. You name it, we was pushing packs. Not since the Great Depression of the 1930s have so many people lined up for a free lunch at the Capuchin Brothers Soup Kitchen in Detroit. These are among the most desperate victims of the recession in Michigan. It began when dealers couldn't sell Detroit's cars. Auto plants closed. Thousands were laid off. If there was more jobs out there, we could get up and get off this welfare. Some people are getting out, like Pearly McPherson. She, her husband, and their three children moved here from Mississippi, but he couldn't find a job. So the other night, they loaded a trailer and moved back to Mississippi. Detroit's Renaissance Center, the towering symbol of the city's economic recovery, has been losing tenants. Shops have closed. The center has lost more than $100 million. When Coleman Young said there's the problem in Detroit is there's no more Dodge Main, everybody poo-pooed it because, you know, all the white people said it was always about race with him. But that was the most accurate thing, I think, that summarizes the situation in the city today. The easy come, easy go theory is all over with, if you're related to the automotive industry in any way right now. But when it came back in 79, one of the saddest scenes I recall seeing was the I had bought dope at Dodge Main in Hamtramck and seeing them close down what they call Dodge Main in Hamtramck and there was a black male in the uh, Detroit Free Press, they showed his picture and they, they showed a, an article saying that he had worked for Dodge for 27 years and he, had, he was crying, he didn't know where he was going to go. The crime rate is rising again, so is drug and alcohol abuse. 81, I had shot a guy on Cascade, man, and he was testifying on me, you know what I mean? So I'm at the 10 precinct, waiting to pay my bond after my prince clear. They bring two dope fiends in there, then the cell next to me. Damn, man, them niggas blow WW head off. I get home, my mama standing in the door crying. You know, I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I get over to Cascade, everybody standing around, Tears fall, saying I love that brother, man. I miss him. He didn't deserve that. Bruzel, my nephew, he was down with the YBIs, Young Boys Incorporated. They would do things out of broad daylight and everybody see it. You don't do anything where anybody witnessed you shooting down somebody. That was their downfall. Everybody knew who was doing the killing. Sure enough, they went down. Then he broke away and started his own crew, 2020 Boys. A motherfucker get his season and it wear out for you. In Detroit, big money in the pockets of small boys has the attention of federal investigators. One of the agents uh, working under my supervision uh, started a case and ended up being the YBI Young Boys Inc. case. He ended up indicting that case along with a group. Within that Young Boys Inc., they had a group called the Pony Down. They had certain little crews that were dealing dope. I, I can't really say. I suppose that when I first got to be more well known was when I started representing a lot of those guys from the Pony Down Gang, which is Leroy Buttram was supposedly the head of it. Dwayne Davis's old crew was spared the indictment, probably due to Davis's death. If Wayne hadn't got killed, we possibly would have got indicted. The New York Times reported today that authorities are trying to crack drug rings, paying the boys thousands of dollars to work as runners, distributing heroin to addicts. One 11-year-old was arrested with $2,000 in his pockets. And one auto dealer said a 15-year-old bought a Mercedes-Benz recently. I believe what happened, and I don't know, because I wasn't working for the government, but I think with respect to YBI and Pony Down, I think it, it got to a point where not enough of these guys were going to jail. We were winning. I mean, Otis Culpepper was representing the, the YBI guys, and it, it, he was winning. Anytime they'd get it, they thought was a good case, and state court would win. Same thing here. They'd bring a homicide charge, I'd win. You can't talk about all those other Chamber brothers or nobody. YBI is the organization that made selling drugs, made it hip, and made killing people okay. 1985, Sturdivant Street near Dexter Avenue. Ray Peoples, recently paroled from federal prison and already having survived being shot on East Philadelphia and Monica and Puritan, is killed while sitting in a car. YBI would never stop to the casket drop. You know what I'm saying? Because there's always a motherfucker trying to emulate us. And that's the aftermath of what these niggas out here doing now. And a motherfucker can't tell you no different. He's an offspring. Whether I done stuck my dick in his mammy or not, he's one of my sons. 
because you're doing shit I used to do. And you're trying real hard at it, but it can never, ever be done again. No arrest is ever made in the murder of Raymond Peoples, and the YBI era comes to an end with Butch Jones in prison and Ray Peoples joining Dwayne Davis in death. But Detroit had been changed forever. YBI was it, and it hit. Mid-83, that's when crack became aware of around the east side of Detroit. Cocaine had become an acceptable drug, but the, the, the explosion, the real explosion, occurred when crack cocaine, and they called it free base, whatever they wanted to call it. Because that was, A, it was, it was destroy, just destroyed people. I mean, just destroyed them. It was free base. So you had to have money to get high. Wasn't no motherfucker bamming on your door with five dollars. But no, this nigga came in on the free base and spent 150 and, and, and blew his brains off, heard them bells. You know what I'm saying? Like Nita Ward said, ring my mother. Dealers can make up to $800 a day, possess an arsenal of weapons, and readily kill to protect their turf and profits. The smallest confrontation can become a matter of life and death. Whenever police raid a crack house, they say they're also bound to find some heavy firepower. Drugs and guns are a deadly mixture, and together they've given Detroit the highest murder rate of any American city. This is a war. This is an epidemic. I've, I've been to Vietnam, but this is a war right here. This is our Vietnam. Where the cocaine, the cocaine was dead, but it just really got real popular. This summer has been especially violent, with more than 500 shootings reported in two months. FBI figures show Detroit with 61 murders for every 100,000 citizens last year. Gary, Indiana was second, and other major cities ran far behind. It didn't get really wild until 84, 85, and 86. Detroit police say they see this less as a crime problem than as a drug problem. Thousands of people, jobless and hopeless, look for a way out and find trouble instead. In the aftermath of the YBI and Pony Down indictments, the hundreds of young workers they'd employed graduated to running their own operations, many of them taking their show on the road, and dealers from Detroit started getting arrested all around the country. The little 40000 we make here a day, we can go out of town and make 80000 Man, we was going to St. Louis, man, Alabama, Cleveland, knocking their heads off. Well, yeah, well, it was easy to go out of town and get it because of the mannerism and the way we was brought up here. As opposed to going out of town, them guys ain't got nothing. They slow. And we go down there and tear their heads up and come home and spend the wealth. Flint, Michigan is a short ride up the I-75 freeway from Detroit and the center of General Motors car production. You know we took that YBI thing straight to Flint because they ain't know no better. Because we were still using a lot of them old stamps that they left. Them guys was going to work, man. We just had to wait till Friday to really, really roll up there. You know what I'm saying? Because they worked all week and got hot in the motherfucker on the weekend. But man, after we stayed in that motherfucker for three months, motherfucker started quitting, getting fired Plants. from the plants, man. And then this shit, this shit just turned into an epidemic where motherfuckers was getting money every day. 85% of them was from the plant. Them suck ass motherfuckers ready for the world. We just sit up in a hotel room with them suckers and, and sell them the dope. And we'll say, oh, oh, Sheila, let me love you till the money comes. Man, you know what I'm saying? Them bitches was smoked out. Uh, Toledo was the, was the first stop. Then we went down to Lima, then we spread it out even farther. We pulled right on in and started doing business, break it off, and so forth. In every state across the United States, man, you got a set of Detroit guys set up in their town. You understand what I'm saying? And I learned this from being in the Fed joint in every state, man. I, I got 188 months. I did 10 years, man, for them suckers, man. The Young Boys Inc. and those that followed after didn't make the streets fill up with drugs. They were just there at the right time to profit off the average citizen's desire to get high. And that's why no sooner than the police sent a so-called kingpin off to prison, another rose up to take his place. Beatrice Holloway walked in my office in 19, I want to say 85. He walked in, I was still in the Lafayette building, he said he had a Fed case, felon in possession. And he just got out of jail, out of prison. He came in and he said, look, I, I'm going to try this case, I've got a defense, which he did. I don't have any money, hardly, you know, I've got, I mean, some 500 bucks, whatever it was he had. But my word's good. He says, I'll, I'll, you tell me the fee. It'll take me some time, but I'm gonna pay, I'll pay the fee. And he was, at the time, literally had just gotten out of jail on federal parole. And there was something about the guy I thought he was telling the truth. And it was, and it was a tribal case, and I'm a sucker for trials. And I said, okay, we got a deal. And we tried the case, and he was found not guilty. Demetrius Holloway, had he wanted to be, could have been a CEO of a, a major 
corporation. He never drank. He never smoked. He laughed at people who used drugs. He was smart as hell. And he was cunning. And he was a leader. He was a big, big whale, is what the cops used to call him. Demetrius Holloway and, and, and Rick Carter, even though they were friends, were as different as two human beings could ever be. Anybody in the streets will tell you that. Soon after getting out of prison, Boone crossed paths with Maserati Rick in an East Side pizza parlor. After one of Rick's underlings started an argument with him, Boone flashed his gun, and Maserati stepped in to defuse the situation. He said, man, did this, man. We could work together if you just give me time to speak with you. We went and got into his bins. We talked, he, he was telling me about himself, about what he do and so forth. He said, you might have heard me, they called me Maserati. Rick was cheap and petty. I mean, he was all right to deal with, but he, 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 was, he wasn't all right to deal with. He was a pain in the ass is what he was. And uh, he liked to flaunt stuff, you know, and walk around like he was a big shot, which I, in a sense he was, I guess. But I want to know what you'd be willing to be my bodyguard. I said, how much you talking? He said, man, I'll give you a couple thousand dollars. Just hang with me. Make sure nobody, you know, do anything to me. Thought about it. And I said, okay, cool, but when am I supposed to get this money? He pulled out $2,000 and gave it to me. Pistol case outside the, the uh, skating rink over there on the east side, because he was an east side guy. He owed me money. I won the case, and that's why I say it was cheap. It was a, I mean, it was a pistol case. He probably owed like three grand or something like that. And the damn guy would not pay. And it was always, I'll see you next week. So I typed up a motion to withdraw. He had another case pending. And I typed up a motion to withdraw, and I called the guy in that was from the east side. I said, take this thing. I wasn't filing it. Tape this thing to the walls and the windows, like at the bars, everywhere on the east side so people can see what a cheapskate Rick is. And, and the guy went out, and about two days later, man, what are you doing? I said, well, shit, you going to come in and bring me the money? And they brought me a leather coat instead. I had just got out of prison. So I had a lot of anger and tension in me. I'm trying to find some way to release it. The best way to release it without going back to prison and so forth was the tough man contest. So I went and fought in that. Cobo Hall. Bruiser brought some of his friends down there, which uh, was the Brown Brothers. Best friends, an ironic name for what the FBI once called the most murderous drug ring in United States history. I didn't really know much of anything about the best friends other than that they were supposed to be a bunch of killers on the east side. But I didn't know they were called the best friends. I just knew they were some evil looking guys. When the fight was over and I stepped out of the ring to go back to the back, uh, Bruiser stepped up and told me that uh, Reggie wanted to meet you, Rock and Reg. They approached me like, damn man, we also hear that uh, you're supposed to be working with Mars Roddy Rick. Suspected of 80 plus murders across multiple states, Best Friends started on Detroit's east side as a murder for hire ring run by the four Brown brothers. I did things for people, for Bruiser, before I met them. By 1985, the Brown brothers were doing hits on the east side for various dealers. We Rick boy, as long as he got the money, it was anybody boys, as long as you got the money to pay us. You ain't got the money to pay us, we, basically, we would take you out and take over your operation. That's when it started happening that way. But a lot of people didn't want to sell to us because we had the reputation of killing. Maserati Rick did sell to us. He didn't mind because he assumed that we was all friends now. That's why everybody would see us. They'd say, oh yeah, Maserati, those are Maserati Rick boys because we was basically hanging with him because, hey, he was selling us the drugs cheaper. I knew that I represented Reggie Brown twice. Represented him on an assault with intent to murder that we won that case. It was in the middle of Eastland. They, they were looking for the guy, they found him and they start shooting. I think they were shooting in the, yeah, in the mall itself, not in the store, but yeah, right in the mall, people were going crazy. Rock and Red would get, like I said, he'd get a little drink in him and so forth, and then he wanted to go on a killing bin. We know we in shootouts. We're like, yeah, damn, man. Is there anybody over here you don't want to shoot? Then I represent him on a homicide case where he shot. He killed one person and the other person he thought he killed, but the guy lived. We consider ourselves hitmen, murderer for hire incorporated. You know, you got the money, we got the gun. Reggie, Reggie was driving down the street on the east side. He, he, he saw that he'd been looking for, the, for Roussel. Reggie Brown started chasing him in the car, jumped out of the car, ran in the house, shot Roussel dead, shot the other guy, thought he was dead and the guy lived and I can tell you from experience not just this case the hardest case there is is when you think you killed somebody and the guy lives and identifies you so he got convicted and Judge Cracker gave him life they were just they, they were cold guys I mean it's I don't know it's one of those things where you wonder I met the father I met the mother the father worked in the factory his whole life mother was regular normal citizen 
In December of 86, unknown assailants shot Ezra and Terrence Brown in the head as they sat in a car near the 7th precinct. Ezra died, but Terrence Book Brown survived by throwing a brick through the precinct's front window to alert the police of the shooting before he collapsed on the sidewalk. A week later, Gregory Ghost Brown is gunned down on Peter Hunt Street, still wearing the suit he'd just worn to his brother's funeral. Having added trained killer Nate Boone Craft to their team of shooters, the surviving Brown brothers, Terrence and Rock and Reg, decided to exact revenge for their brother's death by taking over the city, one kingpin at a time. First up was their so-called partner, Maserati Rick. That was his problem. At the apartment, Maserati Rick introduced Boo to his Colombian connect, Mike. I'm watching Boo and I'm saying, oh shit. Basically, I just stayed with him because at that time, Ed was running around trying to find him. Ed had already shot up a white van that looked like Maserati, but it wasn't. It was some white couple that just happened to be driving down that street and got shot at. Boo calls me and tells me, uh, man, they just shot Rick on the west side, man. Where the hell were you at? Still rode around the car wash looking. We rode down the streets. We stopped at the fish shop. We listened to what people were saying and so forth. So we went to the hospital, talked to him. But at that time, Boo was pissed off like, hey man, uh, word on the street that we bitches. That's what you talking about. They shot Rick, man. The word is that we ain't doing nothing to protect him. And Rick talking about don't go after the people. Boo pulls up. He steps over and said, man, what's up? I said, no, what's up on you? He said, man, I thought you was going to stay away from uh, Rick. I said, no, Rick's still paying me. Man, he can't be paying you laying up in the hospital. And plus, the guy said that as long as we pay his bill, he don't care what happened to Rick. Yeah, the Columbian said as long as he, somebody pay that bill, he don't care what happened to Rick. Basically, the Columbian saying that he don't give a fuck if you, if you do something to him again. He said, who you down with? Us or him? I'm down with whoever got the money. And you should know that. Officials say two men were seen near his room when the shooting was discovered. Really, we don't have a whole lot of details other than the fact that um, some people saw two men. Maserati Rick's beef with Big Ed Hansard supposedly was at the heart of his murder, but no one has ever been convicted. Maz is dead, man. We want you down with us, boy. We want you down with us. I said, man, I'm down with whoever got the money. He said, okay, that's all I want to hear, babe. Everybody gonna think that, uh, that jerk did it, man. So we clean on this. But we gotta go to the funeral, though, dude. Make sure, you know, that people know that we there. We still bagging up Maserati in the life or death. A Maserati, uh, all those names, those names were as big as Mike Tyson and Tommy Hearns and so forth. White Boy Rick. I mean, White Boy was legendary. If not one of the biggest drug dealers in Detroit's history, Richard White Boy Rick Wershey is certainly one of the most well-known. If Rick Wershey would have been anything other than white, nobody had ever heard of him. The, the fact of the matter was, it was so novel to the media, to the public, that here was this white kid that was in Detroit and was supposed to be this big, huge kingpin. Well, I mean, he was 17 years old. There's no damn way white boy Rick or Rick Worshi was the biggest drug guy in Detroit at the age of seven. It's ridiculous. From January 87 to late 87, that whole kind of year, he was it in Detroit in terms of media gangster. And the newspapers followed him. He was eventually charged with possession of eight kilos of cocaine. One day we following him, he went to Kathy's house. We sitting there watching and waiting, waiting for him to come back out. And then all of a sudden, the car pulled up. Two guys stepped out. Brrr, I'm like, we checked around, and from what we get, it was the Curry brother that sent somebody to do that, because he in there screwing one of the Curry brothers' wife. At the same time, he was walking around with uh, Johnny Curry's wife. It's not only the fact that she was attractive but the fact that she was the mayor's niece. There was a federal indictment. I represented Johnny before the federal indictment. And again, pistol case, and, and they had the usual, it was the usual federal case. They had wiretaps, good wiretaps that killed us. You know, just having her on his arm gave him a lot of weight. It came out in, in court documents that Mayor Young had actually told Hart to assign an entire security detail to follow Wershey and Volson uh, 
around on a daily basis, but to in no way make any arrests or stop any criminal activity, but to simply be there in case gunfire was to break out to go corral Kathy and take her away from harm. Then we followed him from over on, um, I think it was Hayes Street. He had, uh, that he had a spot over there. By the time we pulled up on the side of White Boy Rick at the light at Dickinson and uh, out of drive, slid back that door, sprayed him, but the Mac got stuck. Boo was like, man, don't let this motherfucker get away. He took off. Worse, she became linked to the best friends in the media when members showed up at his trial. Well, we went down there to make sure that he didn't get off. We down there and Drew is there pretending we his, uh, that we his crew. When he went to trial, this whole entourage of assholes show up, you know, with their pants on backwards and the Their plan was for Worshi to get convicted so the best friends could assassinate him in state prison. We just wanted to make sure that that boy didn't get out from underneath what he got. Trial lasts a couple weeks. Jury's out for, I believe, four or five days. Comes back guilty. Rick gets life, uh, life in prison without possibility of parole. He had uh, recently just turned 18 years old. His run is over, and, and his life is over in a lot of ways. After finding himself in danger from both Rock and Reg and Boone in Michigan State Prison, white boy Rick called the feds, entered witness protection, and helped initiate a massive police corruption case. It eventually came out the fact that Rick then helped them build a case against Kathy's father, Willie, um, and Jimmy Harris, who was uh, Mayor Coleman Young's chief of security, indicted for, and Rick helped them build the case and for running a uh, protection ring for a drug dealer. And the fact that he's still in jail is, is obscene. Having nothing to do with, I understand he cooperated, whether he did or he didn't. The fact that that kid is still in jail, low these 25 years later, is obscene. Because whatever he was, he was a kid. He was just a kid. Keeping him locked up somehow is in the public good in their perception because he represents that era. He knew a lot of information. The contract was on him for 100, uh, for 100,000 at that point. I ain't mentioned no name, but the political figures, they offered half of it to get that boy. We damn near killed every goddamn body there was to be killed. Those that we didn't kill ran and left the state. Those that didn't left the state went to prison. Big James and them was already dead. Curry brothers, Chamber brothers. October 88. The Chambers brothers are convicted in federal court for running dozens of crack houses across the city, generating millions of dollars a month. It was all about money, homie, power at that time. Everybody wanted the power. Also in October of 88, best friend's hitman, Nathaniel Booncraft, is sentenced to a short stint in prison for drug possession. I go to prison. While I'm in prison, my little brother get killed. I come home to the funeral. People telling me this and telling me that, that uh, Boo was behind and this and that. Bruiser told me exactly what went down and how. He said, man, Andre went to Boo and got some dope. He was over on 12th and Calvin, selling out that apartment there. Boo brought the dope by. He had told Andre, man, that's a bad idea, man, to keep getting from Boo. I decided to set the ass up with the DEA. So I went to the DEA and told them the situation. They did this, man. This dude was responsible for my little brother's death, and I want to uh, help y'all get him, because I know y'all looking for him. So they prefer to have Boo to let me go for, for my participation. Despite working with the DEA, Nate Boone Craft went to do one last hit with the best friends. Well, I had no choice. Either go with them, or they would have killed me right then and there. So they shoot him to stop him from going so they can finish the guy in the back. They opened the door of the cab, Luck did, empty the M16 in his ass. Then a few seconds later, I felt like somebody was pushing me. After killing the target and the cab driver, Chuck Wilkes and Lucky shot Boone in an assassination attempt. That's me getting hit in the back, chest, arm, leg, and so forth. But they say that, oh, it was an accident. Boone lived, but was charged and convicted for second-degree murder and the cab driver's death. That fucked my deal. Terrence Boog Brown never made it to the best friends trial. He was killed in Atlanta and wrapped in his polo bedsheets by other members of the inner circle of best friends on the eve of making a $600,000 cocaine purchase. Because they felt that, hey, Boo having us knock off everybody in the group. You can't be best friends if you're doing your own friends. And that's what Boo was doing. Boo was knocking off his own people. Steve Fishman defended Thomas K.O. Carr in the best friends trial. 
Best Friends got indicted in federal court. I represented Thomas Carr. Thing, I mean, everybody, they had about 45 or 50 dead people uh, in this trial. Most dead bodies I've ever had, where they actually charged it and tried to, they only tried to prove, I think, and did prove, because the jury found them guilty of them, maybe seven or eight. But when you would cross-examine the witnesses, well, that was when so-and-so, Walter Daniels, got killed on grass. Talking about murder was like talking about, you know, your dog ran in front of a car. I mean, it was just... Nathaniel Kraft testified in the best friend's case. He really needed to be on TV in one of those detective or police movies because he played the role of the tough guy and the big hit man. Uh, he scared the shit out of a couple of the lawyers. He, he claimed he was a hitman for the best friends and he killed this guy or he killed that guy. And he was smart. He's a smart guy. Look, he, he basically was, was advertising. If you want someone killed, call me. I mean, that's basically what his testimony was. He got convicted of everything and then the next thing I heard he cooperated and he's out. He got a, he got a sentence reduction and he got Rule 35 they call it. And he cooperated and okay. I know he's out. Uh, so far, I don't know one that haven't cooperated. That's why they just get life in prison without parole. They brought in Charles Wilkes, and he admitted to 15 homicides, 12. And they gave him like a 15-year cap. He's out. Lock your doors and windows. He's out. But yeah, it was a murder case. It was a mass murder case is what it was. If they wouldn't have killed my little brother, none of this would have happened. We'd all still been out there doing our thing. But that brought down best friends. After the best friend's trial, Boone entered witness protection. The D got a badass rep, man, you know what I mean? And it's only a few of us out here, man, that not went in, man, and ain't never ratted on nobody, guys. But they put them in a position where they don't have any choice other than to make deals with people. And I found over time that very often, guys whose reputation in the street is, they never tell, they all do life, they all walk on nails with no shoes on. They have been, but they don't really tell. They don't come in and testify. They just give information, let's say, about people they don't like or people they're at war with. And it's one of the vagaries of, of, of being involved in these kinds of cases. Sammy the Bull, all the mother was in there. When I was in there with Sammy the Bull, white boy red. How the fuck do you tell the motherfucker and go to jail? Like the motherfuckers who ratted on me. Them dumb bitches was sitting up in jail with me. What was the point of telling? When I got there, White Boy Rick had signed me in, and uh, next morning I met with him and told him uh, the deal was. I said, man, did this, man. I knew what happened at the state prison. You thought I was coming in to hit you, which was true. But here, I'm not down at that no more. I'm just like you. I'm a snitch, a turncoat, a fink, or whatever people want to call me. But I call it getting back at the niggas that killed my brother. Zero, no milk. This is in a sink, go the brother running around getting money wearing meats. Won't buy nothing to eat, always buy drinks, get the whole house drunk, then shit pop off. Mama boyfriend tripping by the dime got lost, mine is lost, smoke a blood try Detroit. Police there were called in to break up scuffles after tens of thousands of people turned out to apply for grants from the federal government for housing and utilities. As the desperate crowd got larger, some people fainted, others fought. The city got enough federal money to help 3,500 families pay rent and utilities, but police say 35,000 showed up instead. This is a travesty. I've never seen anything like this in my life. And then tempers started to flare. It's ridiculous. People falling out, fighting, this is crazy. At least five people were hurt in scuffles. Some fainted. More than 100 police officers tried to calm an anxious crowd faced with too much desperation and too few resources. I am Pastor Spencer T. Ellis. I pastor um, the church in the northwest side of Detroit in the Brightmore community uh, called Citadel of Praise. And Brightmore is a very impoverished neighborhood in the city of Detroit. Majority of the people in the city were employed by the automobile industry of one of the subsidiaries, and of course we begin to experience these massive layoffs. So depression began to sink in. Anytime you have a person that's dealing with depression, the first thing they're looking for is a way out. First thing, how can I alleviate my pain, alleviate my fear? I got laid off. I don't know which way I'm going to go. Now, with the economy being so bad, uh, we all feel like it's a doggy -dog, dog world. You get yours, I get mine. More than 20 years after the height of the drug era in Detroit, the city presents a bleak visage. The big three hangs on in a few scattered factories, and the streets that generated the hundreds of millions in drug money are shadows of their former selves. 
For the kids that grew up in the aftermath of wabby eyed best friends and the rest, selling drugs has become just another low-wage job. Man, I first started at 12, man. You know what I'm saying? I used to skip school, go sit up with them boys, them chamber boys. My auntie boyfriend was messing with them. I remember real vividly, man. I get up, boom, brush my teeth. I hit the door. My grandma think I'm going to school. I'm on my way to the Trizzy. Get to the spot, you know what I'm saying? Lock the doors down. They drop the hoop, the whoop off. Number but nickels in that mud so big, where you could cut them boys in half, sell them for 20. Money was just flowing everywhere when you're talking about crack cocaine. Money was just, um, I mean, it was just an easy way out. So now young people start looking at this and saying, instead of working at McDonald's making four fifty an hour, hey, I can sell crack because crack is the biggest thing going. Cocaine is the biggest thing going. It'll never be another YVI. It'll never be another BMF. It'll never be another nothing, man. All that shit is over with. The streets is dead, man. These young motherfuckers out here ain't doing nothing, man. You know, we was cashing out for cars. Niggas riding in cars, they paying no song, man. It's fucked up out here now compared to the way it used to be. Man, I helped tear this community up, so I helped try to put something back, man. In 2010, we gotta keep going forward, man. Take advantage of all our opportunities, man, to make this shit right. They used to say it takes saying a village to raise the children. It ain't no village left to raise, you know what I'm saying? They done tore it all down. So, of course, all of, all of us in at 12 and 13 and 14 years old, like, yeah, that's what I wanna do. I wanna drive a drop top Benz. And I had a personal friend, uh, that actually somehow got caught up into that drug war, making simple runs for whoever he was making runs for, drop delivering drugs. And even to this day, we never know who did it, never found the guy, and we buried him at 14 years old, a great, wonderful young man. Uh, my friend was actually gunned down at Seven Mile in Greenfield, right behind the store, that used to, it's a CVS now, it used to be a gas station there. I think it's unfair for the society to owe young people um, as if they are insane. The drug economy is mainstream in this city. Young kids who are in the dope game are, are talked about almost like disease vectors. They're talked about almost like you hear people talking about rats. You know, what we need to do is clean our communities of this scourge. I'm Luke Bergman. I'm director of research at the City of Detroit Health Department. Most of what I'm involved in uh, has to do in some form or fashion with uh, substance abuse treatment. Uh, and uh, substance abuse prevention services. It's powerful to, to watch the impact that alcohol has on, on them actually because uh, very few young black folks in Detroit do hard drugs. You know, the hardest of the hard living that they're doing I think is because they are drinking at insane levels and I'm motivated by the fact that they are profoundly depressed. They sort of lose any sense of focus or purpose for the most part whatsoever. They're not engaged in any institution. They're not in high school, they're not in college, they're not employed. They've just become, you know, totally wayward. Dr. Luke Bergman wrote the book, Getting Ghost, after working with young drug dealers in Detroit's juvenile detention facility. That is a, is a, is a book that grew out of the, you know, uh, my PhD thesis that I wrote while I was at the University of Michigan, which was about the experiences of young African-American drug dealers working in Detroit. Um, and I spent most of that time living on the west side of Detroit, uh, just off of Linwood Avenue in, in what's usually called the sort of Dexter Linwood area. Uh, and I was living uh, on a little street called Pingree. You know, the, the, it, it doesn't make sense to move around the, the Linwood Dexter area if you don't understand that something catastrophic has happened there. Rodney was the alias Bergman used for the young Detroiter from the Dexter Collingwood area that he grew closest to. And Rodney was kind of this extremely active, extremely charismatic, rowdy young kid. He was 17 at that time. You know, his reputation definitely preceded him, which is really saying something, because there's some crazy cats out on Dexter. I, I, I would drive them to schools in the morning. I would, you know, tutor them in reading afterwards. And then they would be, you know, chopping up rocks and, and selling on the front porch steps, you know, after tutoring. To change your attitude, and to change your demeanor, I gotta change your culture and change your environment. So I, just like in church, I can preach to a guy and we can shout and wave our hand and get happy. At the end of the day, guess where you go back? To the same place and everybody in your community is doing the same thing. You call your boys up, guess where they going? They going to the strip club. They going to get high. They going to rob a liquor store. The, the drug that was being sold the most was heroin um, in paper packs. Uh, certainly it was the drug that was bringing in the most money. And then a lot of weed. 
was being sold. You'd walk in the liquor store and the weed man would say trees when you walked in, et cetera. So it's just sort of like, you know, like being offered a coupon when you're going shopping or something. There is another way of life. And, and, and that's the challenge that we have. I don't know if I have the answer to that because that's where it's going to take not only President Obama, but it's going to take everybody up under him to now we got to change our neighborhood because I can change you. But if I send you back, you're going to get the same dirt back on you after I cleaned you up. And there was this Coney Island restaurant in one of the corners turned into an absolutely blazing heroin spot, probably about $5,000 a day. The only confrontations I would see is when white people would park in the parking lot and try to come into the store because there was a very clear but, but also kind of tacit understanding that if you were white and coming onto Dexter to buy dope, you could not get out of your car. You know, you could see the sort of pleasure that young black people drug dealers would have in, you know, setting these sorts of rules and constraints on white people. Man, we had neighborhood people, but our main clientele was the white people. They used to come down in the Shamrock cabs. East Mac Nichols in Strasburg, by the time you get to six on uh, Strasburg and Finley, you've been and bought everything from prostitution to penny candy, because we had a penny candy store right there on the corner. We were selling dope out of there. Yeah, man, the whole stroll yeah. did like 17,000 a day, man. We say we love the city. We don't love the city. We love getting over, allowing the city to become a, uh, a stepping stone to our success. Because of what we have experienced with political corruption, with a former mayor, former city council, all the staff that has just been indicted for various crimes, the morale in the city of Detroit is very low. Even as a pastor, when I'm approached by politicians, I don't know who to trust. This is not the first time we've been in a crisis. It will not be the last time. And those of us that endure and, and maintain our integrity through this, we're going, to, we, 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 we're going to make it. Everyone is desperate. The people copping are desperate in those areas and the people selling were desperate. Um, when I would drive down the street, literally in waves, young people coming out of their houses and running down their porch steps. And they would just be woo 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 woo, you know, I mean, and, and, and waving stuff for me. You know, if they didn't have money from the drugs that they were selling, for the most part, on their front porch, um, they didn't have shit. During the course of Bergman's research, Rodney was suspected in a homicide at the All-Star Strip Club on 8 Mile. They had a contact in the police department who could get them the, the crime report um, for 2400 bucks. So they got 2400 bucks together, drove it down, it was a sunny afternoon, drove it down to Bovian um, and got this police report. And, he, and within a couple months he had managed to make about $30,000 selling weed in Jackson and retained a lawyer. As soon as he had retained this lawyer, he turned himself in uh, and managed to beat the case in pretrial. My entire body is covered with scars. My back is bullet holes running all through it. My legs, my thighs. I can't even walk properly without getting cold. My leg locking up on me. My arm is no good. AK-47 went in here and blew out all this. Boom. Tore up. They hit me hit poles in it. My hand, my fingers, they don't even work. This hand is just here. Man, fuck the game, man. That was some of the dumbest shit I could have ever got involved in. It's only, it's, a, it's only so many turnouts. Death, penitentiary. You're going to be on drugs like you're saying. You, I never thought I would use drugs. The snowball effect of there not being a real economy in this city that drives kids who are smart and who are leaders and who could have made something of themselves. And by the time they're 19 or 20, they've ruined their life. That's the overriding legacy of the drug culture in the city of Detroit, in my opinion. Don't let them see you doing that. My brother seen me doing it, he wanted to do it, and he got killed. My nephew the same way. Well, he at that point had been, um, was really extracting himself from the dope game and, and had bought a space in which he was building a car wash right on Dexter. So he was wearing a Kevlar vest the whole time he was working on this space. And one day, he finished work, took off his vest, hopped in his car, went up the street to CVS or something to get some beer. Somebody stepped out from a couple of buildings right around a Payless shoe store that used to be there and just filled his car up, uh, you know, with the AK. You know, the corner where he had lived so much of his life, you know, that it also was the corner where he, where he was killed uh, is, um, I think, powerful for anybody who knows him. I'm just hoping that people would take heel and understand that they need to build Detroit, not tear it down anymore. They've been torn down enough from us. Don't follow in us fools' ways of the old time, because now this is a new time. Build this city. What happens when the American system breaks down, when the politicians and CEOs fail in their decision-making? It's called Detroit.
And as the future rolls upon us, remember that Detroit was once the seat of the greatest economic engine the world has ever seen, and now it's just a memory. Let me go back. In the 70s, they had a McDonald's restaurant, had a little spoon. It was a coffee stirrer, and it had a little indentation. It was a little minor plastic spoon. And it became so famous in Detroit <laughs> that they would, you could dip it into a heroin thing and they would sell it a grams of heroin. And they call it a McDonald's spoon. So because of the notoriety that that spoon was used in the drug trade, today McDonald's has changed that spoon with, to a, a flat spatula. Uh, because of Detroit. Because of Detroit.